Thank you for joining Once Changing the World, India's first Future Tech Meets Sustainability podcast. Today, I'm delighted and honored to have with me Mr. Blake Richards, who is an Associate Professor at the School of Computer Science, Department of Neurology and Neurosurgery at McGill University. He's a co-academic member at Mila Quebec Artificial Intelligence Institute. He's the Canada CIFR AI Chair and has received several awards for his work. He has obtained his PhD in Neuroscience from the University of Oxford and his BSc in Cognitive Science and AI from the University of Toronto. He leads the Learning in Neural Circuit Lab and his research interests are at the intersection of neuroscience and AI, the universal principles of intelligence, neural circuits and how the brain learns and remembers, utilizing neuroimaging techniques to study brain function, applying insights from neuroscience to develop brain-inspired AI, and exploring the potential of artificial general intelligence. The topic of discussion today is going to be unveiling the secrets of the brain and brain-inspired AI. So, Blake, really, really appreciate you taking time being part of the podcast. Truly uh, honored to have you on the show. It will be great if you could start with a small, brief introduction and background. My research lies at the intersection of neuroscience and artificial intelligence. I first got interested in this area when I was in the Cognitive Science and Artificial Intelligence program at the University of Toronto. And while I was there, I uh, had the pleasure of learning about neural networks from Jeffrey Hinton. And uh, his class really changed my, my life. I, I found it uh, really inspiring. I found the, the models of neural networks to be fascinating, both because it was the first time that I had seen a model for simulating the brain in a manner where you could actually get it to do real things. And it was mathematically tractable such that you could understand, at least in part, how it, how it worked. Uh, as well, I was inspired by the idea that if we were able to capture at an algorithmic level how the brain operates, this would be good for building better artificial intelligence. Uh, so at, at the time when I was a young student, the zeitgeist in AI was not deep neural networks. This is back in 2004 that I graduated. So we were actually taught mostly what was called GoFi at the time. It was logical based symbol processing. And uh, as a result, even though I really like neural networks, I decided that um, probably my best bet was to try to apply them to understanding the brain. So I went and did my PhD in neuroscience uh, and uh, tried to get more knowledge about the biology of how the brain works. Uh, from, uh, from doing that, that PhD, I ended up deciding I really enjoyed it neuroscience research and wanted to continue as a neuroscience researcher in academia. But I've always still been motivated by that idea that we can model what's happening in the brain effectively using artificial neural networks and use this to mimic, at least at the algorithmic level, in part, what happens in the brain with our models and potentially also in AI systems. So uh, for me, this is uh, sort of the, 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 the most interesting particular niche because I really do like the idea that there are universal principles of computation and intelligence that apply equally to natural and artificial systems. And looking at the ways in which we can mimic natural intelligence in artificial systems is, I think, uh, just a fascinating area of investigation. And uh, so that's what my lab focuses on. Right. I would love to, I mean, you know, I mean, do a deep dive on learning the brain and kind of mim mimicking to kind of build better machines. But I think it'd be uh -huh. great if you could start with, you know, I mean, uh, sharing what excites you most about the field of neuroscience and what breakthroughs you think are needed to fully understand the human brain. I think the thing that I find most exciting about the field of neuroscience, like many neuroscientists, is the fact that we really are studying ourselves. Uh, here in Montreal at the Montreal Neurological Institute, which is just about a 20-minute bike ride from where I am at Mila, there's a plaque uh, with a quote from Wilfred Penfield. If, you, if you're unfamiliar or your listeners aren't familiar with Wilfred Penfield, he was uh, 
pioneering neurosurgeon here in Montreal, who back in the 1930s and 40s and 50s really provided the first map of the human brain. He did so uh, during epilepsy surgeries, and he would stimulate different parts of the brain to try to find the part responsible for epileptic seizures so that he could cut it out uh, in order to treat people's epilepsy. But in doing so, he, he created these, these maps of the brain. If you've ever seen those sensory homunculi where you see sort of like your tongue and your lips and your hands on certain parts of the brain, that was first developed by Penfield. And anyway, so down at the Neuro Montreal Neurological Institute, which he founded, they have this plaque, as I said, with a quote from him. And the quote is, neuroscience is uh, the attempt of man to understand himself. Uh, and so with some excuse for the gendered language, I think that that is a very accurate statement. Neuroscience is about really trying to understand ourselves. It's trying to understand how it is that human beings work and how our cognition works. So it's, it's very exciting for that reason. I think in terms of what we need to understand human cognition, uh, there's, you know, I think it's worth being clear that I'm not sure that we'll ever have like a complete story. Like, I think there's some argument to be made that it's not gonna be like physics where there's say a few simple equations that can serve as a sort of baseline theory for everything. I, I think the brain and biological systems in general uh, resist that kind of overly reductive simplification because they are very complicated systems. But I do think we're learning a lot about the brain. And I think to get to the point where we can understand it, at least to the point where we can really do things with that knowledge. So not just say that we, we have some knowledge about how the brain works, but actually do things like develop medical treatments, develop brain computer interfaces, all this kind of stuff. We're getting there, but I think to get there fully, we need really in part actually better machine learning tools for analyzing neural data. That's one of the key things that myself and others are working on because neural data is so complicated. So if we can get really good algorithms for interpreting neural data, for picking out the necessary pieces of information and identifying the critical patterns, that will help us to really, really get to the point where we understand the brain enough that we can do useful things with it. In the course of the conversation, you said that we might not get the complete story of the entire brain. Yes, I mean, it's very, very complex. I mean, you know, 80 billion neurons, 100 trillion synapses, firing, wiring creates all a, a sight, sound, touch, smell, taste. So uh, why do you think we won't understand uh, a, a complete brain? I mean, maybe maybe talk about that and, and also possibly share, you know, how do you see neuroscience and you mentioned about brain computer interfaces, you know, so how do you see mm. neuroscience, neurotech, both invasive versus non-invasive, change the way how we diagnose as well as treat neurological disorders? And it would be great if you could, you know, share some examples at the cutting edge of uh, what's happening today. What I mean by, you know, we'll never fully completely understand everything about the brain is my guess is that we're going to continue to discover new little aspects of the physiology of the brain basically almost forever. <laughs> In the same way that we are still discovering new species, for example, or new proteins that we didn't know about, it's just, it's too immense. The, the set of different things that we could learn about it is, is too immense for us to ever get to the point, at least within the next, you know, few hundred years where we would say we knew everything about it. I, I think it's just not possible. And... As well, as I said, I think that we're not going to have a situation where it turns out that a simple set of equations fully describe the entire system. I, I don't think that's ever going to be sufficient for our purposes. Uh, so to then attend to your second question, you know, there's a there's a lot of things that I think we could we could do as we develop a better understanding of the brain. So I did mention brain computer interfaces already. I think that's going to be something that will certainly be a growing use case in the coming years. If obviously for someone who's 
got motor problems, being able to control a computer directly with your brain is highly beneficial. And those are going to be the first people who are already actually engaged in trials with brain computer interfaces. But for the average person, even if we start to develop better techniques for reading off information from the brain using non-invasive recording technologies, then I think we could get to the point where all of us are occasionally controlling things via our brain rather than our hands, uh, depending upon the context that we're operating in. Sometimes maybe it'll still be more useful to just use our hands, but there might be situations where, I don't know, like you're, you're driving or something and your hands are doing something else and, and you want to be able to just control things with, with your brain. Um, but there's a whole lot of other applications that can come out of this. So one, uh, another critical one is for dealing with psychiatric disorders. So psychiatric disorders are in a sort of funny state right now in that we all know that we really have to do better with how we attend to mental health issues. Mental health is a huge, huge issue. It, it impacts billions of people worldwide and really reduces the quality of life for many people, everything from depression to schizophrenia to bipolar disorder, et cetera. But the problem that we face is that to date, we don't actually understand very much about the neurological basis of these different disorders. And so in fact, the way that these disorders right now are identified is by behavioral phenotypes. So psychiatrists identify clusters of behaviors and then they create these diagnoses, you know, via the, like in their discussions of the DSM manual, they, they will decide, okay, so when someone has this cluster of behavioral symptoms, then we consider them to have X disorder. But the problem is because that doesn't actually necessarily relate to any underlying neurology, when it comes to providing medical treatments for mental health disorders, we are walking around completely blind. So let me use my favorite example of depression. In the case of depression, we don't really have any good way of determining what treatment a person should have other than trial and error. So you go to the psychiatrist, you're feeling depressed. The psychiatrist is going to try to work out with you what the best course of treatment is for you, but they're not really going to know based on your behavior alone, because in all likelihood, depression, quote unquote, is not a single disorder. There's probably several different underlying neurological issues that go on in different people. And as a result, when you try to give someone, say, a drug like a serotonin, a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor or SSRI, for some people, that seems to help their depression, but for many, it doesn't. Likewise, for some people, getting more exercise seems to help their depression, but for many, it doesn't. For others, you need to go all the way to something like deep brain stimulation to attend to their depression, and for many, you don't. But the only way you figure out which works right now is that you basically engage in trial and error with your psychiatrist over several years. And that means that we're, we're losing a great deal of time to these disorders because rather than treating them effectively, we're, we're sort of engaged in this weird constant trial and error process with our doctors. So if we had a better understanding of the brain such that we could say, no, 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 there's like say three different types of depression or something, then, and, and these three different types have these different physiological bases, and the way to attend to them, therefore, is with this particular type of treatment. This one responds to SSRIs. This one responds to exercise and therapy. This one responds to deep brain stimulation. We could potentially get to the point where people don't have to waste years of their lives in effect, with ineffective treatments for their depression. You rightly pointed out, you know, there's the world is grappling with uh, mental disorder, you know, and because of the race that I think everybody is running, you know, right from children to grown ups, uh, to be more economically empowered, you know, rocking in their businesses and so on and so forth. I think, you know, we kind of, you know, let go of uh, a personal well being. Yep. Do you see that a, a role of AI with better neuroimaging techniques? maybe neuroinformatics help bridge the gap, you know, between 
brain data and understanding its underlying functionalities better would that kind of uh, help in maybe you know uh, finding you know diagnosing the cause better and then eventually possibly getting into the treatment by recognizing why this is happening because i, I think everything has a language you know i mean the way we speak we speak because of a certain language do you think there's an underlying language of the brain also because you know it, it's firing and wiring you know what's happening is the, the these electric pulses you know so would you know these neuroinformatics or neuroimaging techniques uh, i mean if we better understanding would that uh, accelerate our knowledge of first possibly understanding so that we can diagnose and then get to the treatment absolutely absolutely so i think ai will be critical in moving neuroscience forward as i said earlier I think it'll be critical in moving neuroscience forward in two ways. One is in just giving us better tools for analyzing neural data and for identifying complex patterns within it. The challenge that we face in neuroscience is that the the difference say between someone who's depressed and someone who's not is not something that shows up as a really clear easy to measure signal that you can just see with your eyes, right? Like when you record the brain data of someone who's depressed and the brain data of someone who's not depressed, it's not like they look radically different. It's very different from like someone who has hypertension or not, right? Like you can measure their blood pressure and it's obvious they've got hypertension. There's no question about it. So um, AI will be absolutely critical in working out some of these complexities and identifying these different disorders uh by giving us the power to really see patterns in complex high dimensional stochastic nonlinear data like brain recordings additionally ai is going to help us i think to better understand the brain by actually giving us models of the brain so this is this is another area of research that we do in my lab and that a lot of people worldwide do and that is to build artificial neural network models of the brain to try to understand what are the critical functions that operate in the brain and um the the way that i think we can view this is that it it gives us the ability to sort of run synthetic simulations of the brain and run experiments in silico to try to better understand the computational processes and this will be critical as we move forward towards building better models of what's going wrong in different disorders and other things like that because really we need to be able to link it to the underlying computational impact and how that affects our behaviors can you elaborate on the concept of brain inspired ai and how it differs from the traditional approaches different people will give slightly different answers to what constitutes brain inspired ai but my answer would be if the way that you design an ai system is by asking yourself how does the brain do this and how might we mimic in part how the brain does this then you're engaged in something like neural inspired ai and this has been for example how originally artificial neural networks were invented people were asking themselves how does the brain actually compute things and trying to build models of that the earliest artificial neural network models in fact like the perceptron uh program from frank rosenblatt were explicitly an attempt to model the brain as were the parallel distributed processing models of jeff hinton and james mcclelland and uh david rommelhart and others in the 80s again what they were trying to do is they were trying to model the brain these artificial neural networks went on to become now of course the main tool that we use in artificial intelligence and this is in distinction to those more classic mo models that used logic based systems that don't look like what happens in the brain at all uh i think then you know where things start to get a little hazy is in, in something like for example attention so the concept of attention is critical in modern artificial intelligence uh self attention operations underlie the backbone of large transformer networks that we are all familiar with even if we don't know it if we've ever used chat gpt or whatever and um the original inspiration 
that researchers had to put what they called attention into these models was from the brain. It was because we ourselves have the ability to attend to different pieces of information in a stream of inputs that we receive. We place different weight on different things as we shift our attention from them. And the original models of attention were an attempt to replicate that process. So they were very directly brain inspired. But of course, then there's the question of like, yeah, so like the original idea was brain inspired, but the modern version of it that we see with transformers is, is probably not how the brain works at all. Or at least maybe there are some interesting deep connections at the level of the sort of nature of the computations that they can perform. Which kind of, you know, well, which kind of. You know. It's worth saying that the, the, the first invention of transformers in the now famous paper, Attention is All You Need, was not informed by structures of attention in the brain at all. They, they were just constructing a mathematical formulation that built on previous models of attention that had themselves been inspired by the brain. So this is where it starts to get a little bit hazy, you know, so do we call transformers brain inspired AI? I'm sort of willing to let like argue that they are historically inspired by uh, the brain, but not directly inspired by the brain. And uh, yeah, I, I, I would say that's how I would define brain-inspired AI is how directly were you trying to replicate the brain? Um, and if you weren't trying to, you can still maybe have a connection via the papers that inspired you in your research. Right. Yeah. So, so Blake, there's clearly two camps out there uh, working towards building uh, human level intelligent machines, you know, they, they're calling it, you know, the brain was the bronze, you know, the brain was where the neuroscientists are working towards mimicking the brain. And the other is the deep learning camp where the data in, data out model. You spoke about the transformer architecture based uh, next token predictor, large local language models. But, you know, they are the ones who are constantly iterating, scaling, you know, with, you know, multimodal AI, foundation model, agentic AI, mixture of uh, uh, experts model, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It seems that, you know, the camp of neuroscientists are far behind, while the data in data out camp seems to be making all the uh, awesome iterations when it comes to building better, smarter, scalable AI. Uh, uh, what, what are your thoughts on, on that? My thoughts on that is that actually I'm not sure I agree with that particular description of there being two camps. So I would actually say that... Um, there are very few people who are building AI where they explicitly try to mimic the brain in detail. There are lots of people in AI who are, uh, you know, using these models that were ultimately inspired by the brain, artificial neural networks, and some of the ideas like attention, like long-term memory storage, et cetera, that, that were inspired by the brain, uh, but there really the, there's a there's only a small group of people who are trying to more directly mimic the biology of the brain in their models. And I would argue those people are really more computational neuroscientists. Now, there's some hope, and there's some people who are more interested in building AI via more direct neuroscience insights. So so they do exist. But I wouldn't quite go so far as to call it a camp because I think they're a relatively small group of researchers. Now, the hope of this small group of researchers is that they're going to discover something new. So something that, that takes the artificial neural networks that we have and makes them even better, more efficient in some way. And, and there are researchers investigating, for example, more energy efficient AI systems based in part upon neuroscience insights. Uh, so uh, that's that's certainly a thing. Um, you know, one one example of this that uh, that I can think of uh, is um, a, uh, a paper from uh, Klabena Bohen on dendrocentric learning for synthetic intelligence. Uh, that was published in, in Nature a couple of years ago, where he's explicitly trying to think about how to build a better computer chip for AI based in part on neuroscience ideas um, and one that will be more energy efficient. But uh, I, I think broadly speaking, 
these people are, are far and few between. And the reason that everyone is, that, that you're seeing the most impact from people who are just pursuing scale and stuff like that is because artificial neural networks work and backpropagation is a very effective algorithm. So it, there is just an engineering task before us. Like we've basically got the tools to do a lot of pretty impressive things. And then there's just the engineering task of figuring out the details of how you make these things work. And that's what all of these folks who are building new AI models on a daily basis are doing, is they're doing that, that kind of grind of engineering to just take the existing tools that we have and improve how they operate. And I think that's only natural. I, I don't think it's because there's two different ideological camps. It's just that there's always going to be a small group of researchers who are exploring the frontier of this stuff and then a larger group of researchers who are exploiting the existing advances we have in order to make economic impact. Uh, you, you're exploring the uh, idea of building a neuro foundation model. Can you explain mm -hmm. a neuro, what neuro foundation models are? Where does that work currently stand? And what would be the capabilities of a neuro foundation model? So uh, the idea behind a neural foundation model is inspired from foundation models in other fields of AI. Uh, so to describe what a foundation model is, a foundation model refers to a large neural network that is initially trained in a self-supervised manner, meaning that it's not trained on a specific task, but just trained on a stream of data in a manner that helps the network to recognize patterns within that data. So you, you first train a large neural network in a self-supervised manner on a stream of data, you get it to recognize patterns, and then that pre-trained network can serve as the foundation for many other downstream tasks. But when you apply it to new downstream tasks, the important thing is that what you can do is you can just fine tune the model on little bits of labeled data for the specific tasks you have at hand. So to give you one example, the most well-known foundation models are, of course, large language models. So, you know, the way that most large language models are trained now is by predicting the next word in a sentence on a large corpus of text. And therefore, you're not training the, the network to do the things you actually care about. You're not training it to engage in dialogue. You're not training it to answer questions. You're just training it to predict the next word in your sentences. But that pre-trained model serves as the foundation, and now you can fine tune that model towards different applications, such as chatting, such as you know, giving medical advice, whatever. There's all sorts of people making all sorts of applications. Um, another nice one is translation. Like you can pre-train a model on monolingual data sets, and then with very little data, train the model, very little like bilingual data where you've got paired translated sentences, train the model to do translation for you. So a neural foundation model would basically be the same principles of foundation models, but applied to neuroscience data. So what myself and many other people would like to do is to build models where we train large neural networks in a self-supervised manner on recordings of brain activity. So for example, predicting the next piece of brain activity in a sequence based upon the history of brain activity. And the hope would be that if you trained a large enough network on enough data, it would then get incorporate patterns of neural signals, patterns of brain activity, such that it could now relatively easy with relatively little data transfer to new tasks. So Let's, let's come back to that example of uh, diagnosing a psychiatric disorder. Let's imagine that we have um, some different diagnoses for people. We've got a data set of maybe a few hundred people with different diagnoses and brain recordings. Uh, we could do the same for sleep treatment disorders. Like let's imagine we've got brain recordings for a few different, a uh, few hundred people and they're the, the, the diagnosis they receive from the doctors eventually. What you could imagine doing is taking a foundation model that's been pre-trained on lots and lots of neural activity and with these relatively small data sets of just, you know, maybe even 50 individuals or 100 individuals, you could then fine tune on these diagnostic tasks. 
So the foundation model, the pre-trained thing that was just trained to predict the next component of neural activity would serve as the basis for all of these downstream applications. That's the idea of a neural foundation model. And uh, it's something I think would help neuroscience a lot. So, so there are people, you know, working on something called a bi uh, biocomputer, a living computer. You know, recently I read that there's a Switzerland-based uh, startup called Final Spark, where they've connected 16 mini brains made of human tissue, basically human uh, uh, organoids, to create what they call is a living computer. And then there is Google, who have partnered with uh, Harvard and mapped a cubic millimeter of the human brain to create the most detailed map of the human brain ever. How do you think this biocomputer approach and these brain organoids or this human brain connectome uh, insights will help us inch towards the goal of building uh, machines which uh, have a human level intellect? I'm not super keen on the organoid approach. I think that stuff is kind of silly. Uh, so at the risk of offending the people who are working on it, um, the reason I think that it's silly is that I, having studied the the hum, like the the brain for a number of years now, am willing to put a lot of faith in the following statement: the organization of the circuits in the brain really matters. There's nothing magic about human neurons. It's not that you can just take a group of human neurons and grow them in a dish and have them produce something like intelligence. Honestly, like I've seen these cell cultures, they don't do a lot of anything special. And um, I think there's been a lot of misleading statements in the public about what these cell cultures can and can't do. If you actually look at what they do, they don't do a lot. And it makes sense because you've destroyed the circuit. You've taken cells out of the circuit that they're embedded in and you've grown them on a dish in a totally different context. So how are they going to compute anything useful for you? The only way you think they're going to is if you think there's something magic about human neurons that they're just going to wire themselves up into this special array of computing devices. I don't think they do. I don't think there's any evidence that they do. So personally, I think these organoid approaches are actually a misguided direction. I personally would not put a lot of stock in that kind of research. Um, I think that there, there are, though, uh, certainly people who are trying to gain insights from biology to build more efficient AI, and that, I think, is very worthwhile. Will it be helpful to have something like the full 3D reconstruction of a circuit from uh, electron microscopy? Again, my honest answer is I don't think so. I, I know people who work in this area. I think getting full reconstructions, dense biological reconstructions of tissue is useful for neuroscience research. Like that will help us in some way to understand, to, to develop, build better AI maybe in the long run insofar as it will help us to better understand the brain. There's information there to be had about the structure of neural circuits by doing those dense reconstructions. But I don't think what you can do is take those reconstructions and then use them to construct an AI system directly. I think that's kind of a fantasy. These, these reconstructions, these circuits we get from, from looking at say a cubic millimeter of the brain are really messy. And it's again, not clear what the computational implications of these things are. So I think, and actually the same thing goes for the organoids, to be clear. There's a lot of utility for neuroscience research in using organoids because they give you, for example, one great use for them is that you can examine how neurons respond to different drugs and you can use human neurons rather than rat neurons. And that's critical for having the right set of receptors on the neurons. So how they respond to the drugs is, is really important to see in actual human neurons. And since we can't do that in a living human brain, having these organoids is a great thing. It's a great tool for neuroscience. Um, but in both cases, I'm inclined to say it's not going to help us build better AI. It's just going to help us to understand the biology of the brain better. Right. Uh, uh, thank you for the insights. Blake, do you have a definition of artificial general intelligence? And why do you believe that mimicking the brain structure and function is the only path towards uh, achieving uh, AGI? Um, artificial general intelligence. It's funny. I'm on record as saying that um, I don't really believe 
in artificial general intelligence as a concept. I'm uh, certainly more closely aligned to Jan LeCun in this question. I think that what we see in intelligence is that there are um, almost always niches of intelligence that different species and different agents occupy. And um, I would say that we know that, well, we actually know for, for sure that there can't be a system that's good at everything because of a mathematical theorem called the no free lunch theorem. But putting aside the no free lunch theorem, because that technically says that you just can't have something that's good at everything. We, what, what more people would argue is that you can have a system that's good at enough things that for all intents and purposes, it's a general intelligence. And there I'm willing to recognize that there's some, there, there's an interesting question. Like certainly, for example, humans exhibit a higher degree of general intelligence than say a fly, right? Like to be clear, a fly is actually very intelligent in some ways. It's a very efficient system for doing the things that flies do, but they are limited in terms of the set of functions that they can compute. So I'm, what I am willing to say is that there is, I, so, so I don't like the concept of artificial general intelligence as a discrete concept. I don't think we can say this is AGI, this is not AGI. That's nonsense. But what you can say is you can say how general is an intelligence? What is the size of the set of functions that it can conceivably compute for you? And there, I do think that, you know, we are moving towards AI systems that can compute larger and larger sets of functions for us. You know, large language models can do way more, many, many, many different tasks than, say, the convnets that we had trained just to do object categorization. And so in that sense, I think we are moving towards more and more general intelligence, even though I don't think we're ever going to reach this point where we have a discrete moment where we say, ah, that's AGI. But yeah, so we're moving to more and more general intelligence. I think that um, one reason to continue to take inspiration from the, the brain, at least in part, when moving towards this quest of more general intelligence is that hum the human brain is really the only good proof of principle we have of a very general intelligence. The now there's some exceptions actually. So for example, my my one of my favorite examples is like raccoons. Raccoons can do a lot of different things. Uh, they're a very generalist animal. Uh, so are pigeons and rats. These are all generalist animals who can compute a fairly large set of functions. But humans blow that out of the water. Humans are way more general than rats and raccoons and pigeons. Um, and so in that sense, mimicking the human brain is maybe a good way to try to increase the generality of these systems. But it's possible that the best way to increase the generality is just going to end up being to increase the generality of the data that we train these systems on. So I'm not actually a believer that we need neuroscience insights necessarily to create more general intelligence. I, I actually would not subscribe to that. Where I think we really need neuroscience insights is instead to construct more human-like intelligence. So if our goal is not just a general intelligence, but a general intelligence that is human-like in the way that it processes things, then I think inspiration from the brain is absolutely a, a critical component. So you're saying that we might never be able to build a general purpose intelligent, though there is some magical things happening, even with these data in, data out, large language models, you know. There was this paper uh, which the OpenAI team kind of wrote about uh, Spark of AGI. There was Stanford, you know, which, which kind of, you know, wrote another paper saying that there's emergent properties are a mirage. Would, would, would be great to, you know, get your thoughts on these large language models where it's but just basically data in, data out. But people claim that there is some kind of emergent properties over that. I'd love to hear your thoughts on these large language models. And what, what what's your intuition? What do you think is required to build maybe a, a machine that uh, has some kind of uh, human level intellect? W would it be more data? Would it be a complete novel AI architecture altogether? W what are the key hurdles you think we need to overcome to 
achieve that if not a, a, a complete artificial general intelligence a, a, a human uh, level uh, intelligence so i i i suppose what i would say is that um so first of all as as noted it's not that i reject the idea of general intelligence i think we can move towards more and more general intelligence i just dislike the idea of agi as a discrete category but putting that concern aside um you know large language models are clearly a more general intelligence than previous ai models that's obvious to anyone who's worked with them uh my you know someone another person who i admire greatly is blaze aguera iarkes at google and he's uh, on record as arguing that we already have agi in these llms uh now i know blaze well enough to know that if we had this nuanced conversation he would agree with me that there's maybe no discrete thing where you can say this is agi this is not agi but he's right large language models are already very general now there's an interesting question of are they as general as human beings i'm not sure that they are but in some ways maybe they're more general there's certain things that they can do more easily than we can uh but i would still be inclined to say that if we consider the total set of computations that we can perform it's it's probably still well beyond that of what our large language models can perform um now this question of how do we get to more and more general systems I actually think the key question is is mostly data. I think there's some additional architectural things that have to happen which people are working on such as for example the inclusion of long-term memory stores in these systems so that the the system is capable of keeping a record of what is true as it were and having memories of what has happened to it specifically in the past. But uh I would say that the, you know there's just these sort of additional components that need to be added that are not hugely different i don't think we need a totally new architecture i think we've we've already got some of the basic principles i think next step prediction is actually an incredibly powerful tool for developing an understanding of the world because as ilya sutskever says the only way you're going to actually predict the next token successfully is if you understand something about the world so it implicitly forces you to construct a model of the world when you do these next step prediction tasks um so i i don't think we're going to need something radically different i think we can do next step prediction give it some long term memory but i think the thing we do need more of is rich data the the data that we train our llms on is ultimately so impoverished relative to what a human being receives in their childhood you know we all receive just this stream of incredibly rich sensory motor data that includes not only different modalities but also direct interactions with the actions that we're making so we're in this active loop with the environment and i think the only way we're going to get to truly human levels of general intelligence is if we train ai systems on similarly rich and interactive data sets that would be my guess yeah, there are some experts over here who believe that agi poses a potential existential threat uh, what mm. are your thoughts on this concerns and what are the ethical considerations we should keep in mind when developing uh, human level intellect uh, uh, brain inspired ai i do not personally think that there's a grave existential risk from ai uh i think that the people who express concerns about this including people who i admire greatly like jeff hinton and yashua benjo who both have been mentors to me and who i think are arguably two of the greatest geniuses of the 20th century on this particular issue i don't actually agree with them <laughs> I I I think that what they and many others are doing is they're not recognizing that the the ways in which new forms of intelligence and new species interact with each other is rarely in this sort of just like one dominates the other way. Um this is something that Jan actually argued a while ago with uh another researcher who I admire greatly Tony Zador that this concept of like dominance and taking over the other one is actually a concept that um derives from our own evolutionary history as primates it's in primate social groups that you see 
dominance relationships and hierarchies and all this stuff. And, and that's why we're primed to think in this way, because being primates ourselves, we have a tendency to frame things in terms of social hierarchies and dominance. And so then we naturally think, oh, well, the AI will want to dominate us uh, because that's how you naturally do things. And I think that's wrong. I think a, a truly uh, general purpose intelligent system will seek out symbiotic relationships with humans because that would actually be most beneficial for its long-term viability as, as, a, as an agent. Uh, so I don't think we have to worry about extinction explicitly. But that being said, I think there's that many people are right to raise alarm bells, including Joshua and Jeff, about the ways in which these systems could just go wrong. Like putting aside any question of human extinction, we can imagine misalignment problems in AI systems that lead AI to make decisions that are really bad for a lot of people. And even potentially AI systems that have been used for malevolent purposes or given malevolent goals, achieving really bad things. So there are real concerns that are valid here, like putting aside the question of extinction, there are massive potential dangers with respect to having a highly general purpose intelligence in key pieces of the economy and or, you know, uh, government structures that then can behave in misaligned ways and stuff like that. So we absolutely do need to worry about these problems, uh, even if we don't, I think, need to worry about extinction. But I think the best way to attend to this is just that we do need better government regulations on this stuff. I think there's, there's not, what's happened with OpenAI is basically evidence that self-regulation is not gonna work on this stuff. You need governments to actually step in and, and provide some guardrails on what you can produce, what you can release. Um, but of course, in a way that doesn't then just create a moat for existing companies. So I don't think we have, we have to be careful. We don't want to, I personally don't want to see AI research shut down. I just want to see ethical review boards, external auditing, these sorts of things to ensure that the way that the models are getting built is taking into consideration their potential for downstream harms. I, I hope that uh, the world keeps on uh, making innovation more accessible and rather than stopping, I mean, you know, uh, creating, uh, you know, I mean, like governments and stuff like coming together where they kind of find ways to regulate that. Uh, today, yes, I mean, obviously, I mean, don't really think AI is an existential threat, but even today, I mean, you know, the way AI is, is kind of taking over, and it's twenty twenty four. I like to think in in long terms. You know, what would the next ten years look like? You know, because even today we have these uh, uh, AI. I mean, you know, there's misinformation with AI. There's deep fakes. Then there's AI job loss with automation because there's so many of these large language models, you know, generative AI tools, which is you know doing you know your text to images, text to videos, text to three D, text to world building, and and it's it's just I mean it's 2024 at the rate at which these uh, uh, models are accelerating. How do you see the next? 10 years kind of panning out, uh, you know, how deeply you think society, society is going to get impacted and what do you think government's institution needs to do to make sure that humans coexist with machines and flourish? So, so I think the key thing is just for, for, like I said, for us to have appropriate ethical guardrails in the same way that we do for human experiments. You know, if you want to do an experiment on human beings, you have to run through an ethics review board. You have to make sure that your research is adhering to legal standards regarding consent and stuff like that. Similar structures need to be set up in place for AI research, in my opinion. And I think if we can get that right, I, I actually think that the, the sort of like our ability to live with machines is not going to be a huge issue because I think the machines that will be constructed will be largely for beneficial purposes if these guardrails exist. Blake, my last question to you. Are, are there any updates that you would want to share from Link Lab and what's your personal moonshot? Uh, my personal moonshot right now is to build some of these foundation models for neuroscience. 
Uh, I really want to see this happen over the next few years, and we will be pursuing this in my lab in collaboration with all our uh, collaborators. Um, I, I think uh, the other thing that I'm really excited about, though, is we've got a paper come that just came out on archive and will hopefully be out in a journal not too long from now on predictive learning, on doing multi-step prediction, uh, and how that actually explains the hippocampus very well. And uh, for me, that's, from a neuroscience perspective, a really exciting finding, and, and we're keen to push more on that. Public, really, really appreciate you taking time and being part of the podcast. Uh, I mean, whatever approach is, uh, uh, that uh, we take, you know, to building out machines that are more capable, you know, possibly it's artificial general intelligence or just human level intelligence, whether it's mimicking the brains or the, the, just the data in, data out. I hope that, you know, the, the teams who are at the forefront building uh, this tech keep humanity in mind because you know, somehow I feel that, you know, there is not too much conversation on the general impact of AI on society. Once we get to AI, that's much more capable than, uh, you know, a, a human, you know, what would that kind of mean? So I hope that we build something where which makes everything more accessible and, and you know things more equitable you know so really really appreciate you taking time being part of the podcast and to my listeners if you like what you see in here then please press the subscribe button and until next time see you guys bye bye thank you thank you Blake. really appreciate this thank you eddie it's my pleasure